Hello there and a very big welcome to you joining us live for the launch of three satellites uh, from the Guiana Space Centre in South America. We're here in Paris. There on the pad we have two telecommunication satellites and one mission extension vehicle which is very exciting new technology. Now we're starting the programme we believe with a red status panel. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Stefan Israel who is the CEO of Ariane Space, the company launching the satellites. Thanks for being with us, Stefan. Um, as I said, we're starting with a, a red status panel, and it would seem that Mother Nature is not being very kind to us at the moment. Yes, so you know that uh, to be ready for our launch, you need basically three things. You need the launcher to be ready, and uh, up to now, the launcher is perfectly ready. You need the satellites of our dear customers to be ready, and they are ready, but you need also to have the, the weather on your side. And up to now, we do not have the weather on our side, so we will have to wait a little bit during the launch window to see whether it turns out to be green, but now it's red. So just to explain that, we have a launch window tonight of about 47 minutes. A launch window, of course, is the time during which we can launch. We hope to launch at, uh, at some point during our launch window tonight. And so fingers crossed for the weather. Um, Stefan, tell us about our satellites. We've got three on board. Yes, so we have uh, three satellites on board, which is very uh, unusual because usually we have two satellites on board and tonight we have three satellites on board. In the upper positions, we have Galaxy 30 for Intelsat. We have MEV2, which is a mission extension vehicle for Space Logistics LLC, which is a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman. And in the lower position, we have BSAT 4B and Maxar. BSAT 4B is a Japanese operator. And you know that we have very, very long lasting relationship with Intelsat. First Intelsat satellite was launched in 1983 and be sat in 1997, so an old story between us. Uh, and that's one of the wonderful things about space, isn't it, is the yes. great relationships yes. that develop over, over many, many years. Now, what's been happening in recent days? Yes, so uh, you know that uh, a few days ago we have had to change uh, a sensor uh, which is inside the liquid hydrogen tank of the, main, uh, of the main stage. We have made this operation on August the 7th. It has been done perfectly well, and so we have made the transfer of the launcher on the launch pad two days ago. Okay, well, let's see if we can go over now to the Guiana Space Center, because, of course, as I said, we, Stefan and I are in Paris, and in the Guiana Space Center, we can actually see there is the Ariane launcher on the pad. It's an Ariane 5, the heavy lifter of the Ariane family of launchers, and this is the launch Con Mission Control Center, and this is Luce Fabriget. Luce, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Are you able to give us any more information on the situation tonight? Uh, yes, uh, pleased, Katie. Uh, so you, here we are in the in the flight directorate, the flight desk, uh, where we are four of us for tonight. Roland Lagier, our highest technical authority at Iron Space CTO. Bruno, Bruno Gérard, who is heading the uh, Iron Space teams here in French Guiana, fully connected with, uh, with local authorities, and on communication aspects with us, Martin, Martin Studer. Uh, and we will have uh, this flight desk tonight. We will have the, the final say and the decision uh, to go or to postpone. Oh, As was explained by, uh, by Stéphane, you can see that... Uh, Sorry, I, I interrupted you, Luce, and I didn't mean to. I was going to say, obviously, very responsible job. I think you were going to go on to tell us the latest. Uh, yes, we, 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 as was explained by, by Stefan, in fact, we need three entities to go, the satellites, and the, they are here in front of us. The customers are there, ready to go. The launch vehicle 
on uh, with its grand segment is also clear and uh, green tonight and as you've seen uh, we've got uh, on, the, on the big screen in, in front of us we've got a red on the on the meteor side uh, as you know five hours ago before 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 the launch five hours before the the h0 that was uh, targeted we decided and we took the decision to fill the, the the launch vehicle at that time we took this, this decision based on the weather forecast for the h0 for uh, 6 33 pm that that is local time for the opening of the launch window based on the on the models we have on the on the weather forecast for this h0 after that we had a, a balloon a new balloon we had the balloon also in the in the in the morning but we have a, we had a new balloon around three hours before this uh, targeted h0 and this balloon gave us an information that wins in terms of uh, of uh, direction and in terms of levels were were not favorable for launch at the beginning of the launch window at six 33 local time. So we decided to have a new balloon and this new balloon was launched uh, a little more than one hour ago and its, its, its data are being processed now and we will have the results for these balloons in a few tens of minutes and that means we are no more in a position to target the beginning of the launch window, 6.33 p.m. And so the, the operations will go on and we will stop the the operation on the on the launch vehicle on the ground segment at minus seven minutes before the launch that is the beginning of the of the automated uh, uh, sequence and at that time we will stop uh, the, the 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 countdown and we will uh, we will wait for the information coming from this new uh, balloon for the last balloon of minus one thirty uh, minutes one hour and 30 minutes and based on this uh, on this data we will decide to go or not and that means we will not target the beginning of the launch window as i said but we will target a new h0 at 7 pm and four minutes Luz, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to explain that to us so just to recap we are waiting now for the synchronized sequence which starts at minus seven uh, for the countdown to stop at that point, which is what we are expecting to happen. Waiting for the range operations manager. À tous de DDO, ready to count suite à un rouge lié aux conditions météo. Que tous les moyens restent prêts pour la reprise de la chronologie à 0 moins 7 minutes en cas de retour au vert. Okay, so the range operations manager, just to uh, translate that for, for everybody who doesn't speak French, has announced that we have a new launch time fixed, which is 7.04 Kuru time. Is that correct? Yes, so uh, as explained by, uh, by Luz, so we are now going to monitor the weather. And if uh, there is a positive evolution, which can happen, then we should be ready for a new uh, launch, uh, a new uh, launch slot, which uh, should be at. Uh, so in uh, Kourou, it will be 7:04, and uh, the decision will be made 10 minutes before. So I think we will come back 10 minutes before 7:04 to see uh, how the situation is evolving. And if this uh, red turns out to be uh, green, which would be positive, otherwise we will wait up to uh, tomorrow. Okay, thanks very much indeed for that, Stefan. So just to recap on those those times that Stefan was saying, so that's uh, a new launch time of 7.04 in Kourou, in French Guiana, and that is a launch time of uh, 10, I believe, 04 UTC, uh, universal time. So we're going to come back to you nine minutes or 10 minutes before that at around about 5 to 10 in the evening universal time that's about 5 to 12 in Paris and we will see you back here then please come and join us thank you
Hello again and uh, welcome back to our live programme. Uh, we have three satellites on the pad at the Guiana Space Centre uh, waiting to lift off. They are Galaxy 30, MEV2 and BSAT. 4B. Now we had to put the countdown on hold uh, because we had we've had a weather issue, um, as we were saying earlier. Mother Nature hasn't ne hasn't necessarily been too kind to us. But uh, Stefan Israel is joining me, um, and Stefan, I have to tell you that when we look at the pictures of the launcher on the pad, which maybe our our director can show us some pictures of the pad, it doesn't actually look like the weather's particularly bad out there. Yes, but you know, you have two reasons not to launch due to weather conditions. The first one is when you have uh, storms, uh, and this you can see it. And the second one is when you have uh, negative uh, high altitude winds, and unfortunately, you do not see it. But look at the screen. The meteor is now green, so we can go tonight. So that's good news. So good we've, news. Got a, we've got a new launch time, and there you can see the launchers. So on the pad, the, the Ariane 5, the heavy lifter of the family. Uh, our original launch time was 6.33 Kuru time, that's 9.33 Universal time. And you can see there... Suite au retour vers des conditions météo, le nouvel H0 visé est 22h04.00 TU. Je répète, le nouvel H0 visé est 22h04 minutes TU. Le temps des contre démarra à 21h57 minutes 00 TU. Good. That means that the range operations manager has now announced that everything has gone back to green and we have a new launch time which is uh, 10.04 universal time which I believe is uh, 19.04 I think in Kourou in French Guiana. So that's, that's good news. That's great, yes. That's great. So... Um, I'm going to let you go now, Stefan, and head back to your team. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you later. Thank you, Thank you Stefan Israel, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I'm going to introduce us now as well to Damien Gilles, who is an expert who's going to be joining me for the rest of the programme. Damien, thank you very much for joining us. Do take a seat. So, Damien, let's just talk about the status panels, because we could see those status panels on the screen. Sorry? So, I didn't quite hear him there, but I believe that we've uh, now started the synchronized sequence. So that's good news. The synchronized sequence being the last seven minutes of the countdown. This is the automated sequence when everything's happening automatically. And you can see the status panels there, Damien, on the left-hand side yes, of the screen. You have there the, the status panel, sorry. Uh, where all the subsystem coming from the launch base, the launch range, the launcher, and the customer give their status towards the mission control center. And it's like a traffic light. If everything is green, it's a go. If it's red, you should stop. Obviously, and the red status panel means that one of the systems across the base is requesting that the, uh, the countdown goes on hold. And of course, now our countdown is, is back on track. So um, we, there are, we have a number of different teams in the control centre. We have the um, programme managers who are some of the teams who work closely, aren't they, with the, with the client. What do they do? Exactly. They are the sole contact between Iron Space and our customers. As you know, the customer is very important for Iron Space. That's why we dedicate people that are the single interface and they work very closely with the customer nearly three years for these missions for both customers. And you can see there on the screen Marie-Laure Chauffour who is the interface for Galaxy 30 and in vitro. Indeed, working hard there and working closely on her phone, talking to customers, no doubt. Now, um, we are using, as we said earlier, the heavy lifter of the Ariane family. It's Ariane 5. She's a big, powerful beast. And she's going to lift, hopefully, our satellites into space. What happens after launch? The booster ignition triggers the liftoff of the launcher. Shortly after, the launcher performs a pitch maneuver in order to get into the required direction. The boosters are separated roughly two minutes after liftoff. And then we separate the fairing when it is not needed anymore to protect the spacecraft from the atmosphere. 
The main stage engine switches off when the launcher detects that the intermediate orbit is to be reached. This event is called injection. The main stage then falls down into the Atlantic Ocean and the upper stage engine switches on and will carry our satellite up to their injection orbit. During this path, the satellite flies through the atmosphere, which is thin but very fast. It generates aerothermal flux. The upper stage switches off when the final orbit is reached. It marks the beginning of the ballistic phase, where we will separate our customer. First, Galaxy 30, then MEV2. Before releasing BSAT, we release the SILDA, the dual launch black structure that you can see. And finally, the release of BSAT 4B. The launcher completes its mission with the start of the passivation, and from now on, the teams from the Spacecraft Mission Control Center take over and perform all the maneuvers up to the final destination of the spacecraft. And of course, um, Galaxy 30 and BSAT 4B will be traveling to their final orbit in space, which is in geostationary orbit, but MEV2 has got a slightly different job, hasn't it? It's yes, MEV2 is really a different vehicle because instead of going to a predefined location in the geostationary orbit, it will dock to another satellite and will perform all the maneuvers that are required to maintain this satellite in position, and so it extends the lifetime of this customer. It's really incredible and very, very exciting technology. This is the second time we've done exactly, it. Exactly, yes. Yeah, so it's, it, it's really, really wonderful. So uh, the computers on the ground uh, will have now given the launch time to the computers on board. So prior to that, the launcher didn't know what time it was actually lifting off. And if you look at the top of the vehicle, you can see we call them the cryogenic arms, those structures clamping onto the top of the vehicle, and it's pumping cryogenic propellant in. That's liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, oxygen stored at very, very cold temperatures. Yes, because we need to get them liquid, and so the temperature for the liquid hydrogen is minus 253 degrees, and for liquid oxygen, minus 183 degrees. And they are so cold that they evaporate, and we have to top in, the, to top in up continuously up to the final moment and we disconnect the cryotechnic arms six seconds before uh, H0. So you'll see that happening just before launch. Uh, another thing to watch out for is the fact that we switch the engines on the main stage, the minute. seven seconds before the boosters. Top, one minute. We are one minute to launch. We're live at the Guiana Space Center for the launch of Galaxy 30 and MEV2 for Intelsat and BSAT 4B for BSAT, Maxar and everybody in Japan. Our very best wishes to all the teams now as we sit back and watch the launch. Good luck, everybody. de DDO, attention pour les décomptes finales. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top L'image Vulcain, l'image VAP, La propulsion est nominale. And we are off. Galaxy 30, Mission Extension Vehicle 2 and BSAT 4B have started their journey. He's telling us that the trajectory is normal. And we've broken the sound barrier, Damien. 
Exactly, we are now traveling faster than the speed of sound, which is equal roughly to 1,200 km per hour, and the speed will continue to increase in the coming seconds. And look at that, Ariane 5 is blazing a trail across the night skies at the Guiana Space Center, heading out over the Atlantic. Everything's going according to plan. Right now, we are using the boosters to get us away from the gravity of our Earth, aren't we? They're doing all the work. Yes, they are doing most of the job because they provide roughly 90% of the thrust today. It is equivalent to 13 jet engines for each booster. And their job is really to push us away from ground and to provide sufficient velocity to the launcher. And we need a lot of energy to do that. Each, propellant, uh, each booster sorry, burns two tons of propellant per second. That's an awful lot. And if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, what you could see there was our distance uh, from the pad. You could see our speed or velocity and our altitude. And you'll see it again in a minute. We can see the trajectory, which is the planned trajectory. There it is on the right-hand side of the screen. Our planned trajectory. And the white cross is the actual position of our launch vehicle. Good. He's telling us that everything's going normally. And at the top of the screen there, you can see our flight path. We are now losing the boosters. They have done their job. They've burnt their propellant. We don't need them anymore. The lighter we are, the faster we go. And if you look at the front, the top of the vehicle, that section containing the satellites, we call it the fairing. What's its job? Its job is to protect the satellites from the outer world. First, at liftoff, because the liftoff generates a lot of noise, so it protects the satellite from this noise. And during the atmospheric flight, it protects the satellite from the friction with the atmosphere, which we call the aerothermal flux. If you look at our altitude, you can see we're 100 kilometers above our planet. That means we've crossed the border with space, often known as the Kármán line. Getting closer now to being able to eject our fairing. That's what it looks like because we don't need it anymore, Damien. We're in space. Exactly. The effect of the atmosphere is now very low. So we don't have enough thickness in the atmosphere to, for friction to bother us. And we can see our satellites for the first time. At the front there, you can see Galaxy 30 and MEV2. And then there's a black structure. That's called the SILDA. And inside that is BSAT-4B. You can't see it right now, but we will see nominal. that later. Uh, you're getting information in your ear, aren't you? The exactly. range operations manager's hearing it, and you're hearing it too. Yes, I have a direct link with people located near the launch pad. They are located in Galio, a few kilometers away, and they received directly the telemetry from the launcher and gave all the confirmation and all the status, and the range manager receives exactly the same information. And at the Space Center, the range operations manager is responsible for calling that out to everybody. Our flight path takes us out across the Atlantic. Uh, we're traveling along the equator. We have a number of tracking stations along that flight path, and they pick up the signal. You can see our flight path there. They pick up the signal from the launcher as it flies over. Is that right? Exactly, and we have a network of stations which are located all over the flight path. The first one is located in Galio, which is a few kilometers away from the launch pad. It will cover all the beginning of the flight up to the main stage flight. We have then Natal, located in Brazil, which will cover part of the main stage flight. And then we have the next station, which is called Ascension, which is located in the South Atlantic. And we have in a, a gap, what we call a telemetry gap between Natal and Ascension. It means that we have a loss in the visibility, but this is completely nominal because we foresee it and we do not lose the data because we record them in the onboard memory and we download them when we are back in visibility. The next station is Libreville, and we have exactly the same phenomenon between Libreville and Ascension, where we have a telemetry gap, which is exactly nominal. And at the end, we will be in direct visibility of Malindi, which is located in Kenya. And Malindi will allow us to follow the end of the flight 
and in particular, the ballistic phase, where we will have the separation of all our passengers. Thanks very much indeed for talking us through that, Damien. So those are, that's the last station you can see there on the film, Malindi in Kenya. And the guys and girls there will be tracking the separations. Joining us now in the studio is Raphael Chevrier. Raphael is a business developer at Arian Space. Thanks very much indeed for, for, for being with us, Raphael. That means part of your job is very much looking to the future, thinking about future technologies and innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, if you think about it, like uh, only six decades ago, we've been launching uh, the first uh, spacecraft in space. And uh, in the meantime, we've been sending uh, humans on the moon, uh, spacecraft on Mars, on asteroids and beyond. And so a lot uh, has happened in six decades. And today we are launching satellites for telecommunication, internet, navigation, Earth observation. So you can see that space is really part of our daily lives. And that's very uh, evolving uh, a lot. Absolutely. And the people who are making that happen are... There right now, we're looking at various important people there in, in the Guiana Space Center. Who, who are they and what are they doing? Here we can see the people from ESA, the European Space Agency. And these people are currently monitoring the overall status of the launcher to check that it was inside the qualified domain. So here we see the head of the ESA office in Kourou. All these teams, very important. Uh, getting the scheduled moment here for the acquisition of the signal, picking up the signal at the tracking station in Natal, in Brazil. One of those tracking stations that you mentioned to us back there. And there we have the confirmation there from the range operations manager that we've picked up that signal. Raphael. And he's telling us, just a translation for everybody, that everything on board is going according to plan. Raphael, um, given that the launcher operates remotely, why is it important for us to have the tracking stations? Well, it's very important for, I would say, two main reasons. The first one is safety. It's always safety first when it uh, comes to launch uh, satellites in space. So you really need to uh, make sure that uh, you have a visibility of your, over your, the whole uh, launch sequence and especially in dynamic phase of the launcher. And so, uh, yeah, uh, it, you really need to uh, have uh, know how to react if something happens. And then the second is uh, you collect data and then you can know more uh, about your launcher for the next uh, launch. And we have separation there of the main stage and ignition of the upper stage. This is very much now the next phase Image of our PSC. journey. And the range operations manager has confirmed that we have the upper stage engine switched on. The upper stage is a very important piece of kit. Its job is to deliver our satellites into space, Damien. Whereabouts has it got to take them? Exactly. It will deliver our customers to an orbit that we call a geotransfer orbit. The geotransfer orbit is particular in the sense that it is elliptical, so it's like a shape of an egg. You have the short part, which we call the perigee, which is located close to the Earth if you have an ellipse. And the highest altitude point, which we call the apogee, is the apogee of the geo orbit, which is 35,786 kilometers. And this orbit is really important for our customers. Yeah, I mean, uh, GTO orbit, uh, geo orbit is a very, has been used intensively to launch uh, telecommunications, telecommunications satellites uh, mainly. And it's uh, very also important because the satellite states. Uh, on a fixed point, is like uh, following the rotation of the Earth. It's like uh, when uh, you are like holding your uh, child's hand on a roundabout, then you're staying at the same position with respect to your child when your child is turning around. So it's very important that you can deliver services daily, like uh, 20 hours a day. And right now we're looking at a replay. This was 10 minutes and 28 seconds ago we lifted off from the pad at 7.04 French Guiana time. That's what it looked like. It was a really beautiful launch. It was incredibly impressive. I, I always feel a bit sorry for, for these guys because they have, to, they have to watch the launches on screens, whether you're in mission control or whether you're in launch control. Uh, 
Have you seen launches in yes. real life? I had this opportunity once, so it was really impressive. This is a moment that I will always remember because you are impressed first by the power because you really feel the power of the launch. And then you see the light, which is really impressive, and the noise generated by the launcher. So even if you know how it will work, nevertheless, you are impressed when you leave it alive. And this is really something that you will remember for years. And I guess it was the same also for you, Raphael. Yeah, it was, it was pretty much the same. Like, I remember the bright light and the sound coming from the ground. That was very impressive. And I also remember that I was really hesitating between, like, taking pictures with my phone or leaving the moment. And I quickly put my phone back to my pocket and uh, lived uh, the moment because like, the images are like, just uh, breathless, really. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a really exciting thing. And you actually feel the vibrations as well, which is quite impressive, isn't it? And of course, Ariane 5 is the biggest of the family of launches here. She's incredibly, you know, incredibly big. And Raphael, today she's more efficient than ever. Just very, very briefly, tell us why. Yeah, um, it gained um, over uh, the years, um, 2016, uh, 300 kilograms of uh, performance. So DNA is part of... Uh, Innovation is part of our DNA, and we continue, uh, uh, continuously improve the performance for Let's the customer's benefit. Absolutely. Let's yeah. go and find a, watch a film now and see what those improvements involve. Well, for the Ariane 5 um, performance increase, we have introduced the so-called Performance Increased Competitiveness Program, which is mainly addressing two axes. The first one is elongating the tanks to put more propellants inside. This is in the ESC part. But uh, secondly, we were elongating the equipment bay, the VE BH, uh, to enable much, much more payload inside the IAN, and um, introducing also uh, a more innovative membrane which will also be used in the future in the Ariane 6. Soon as we finished PIC, we had to start with PIC because the market, the market was, was demanding much more performance. It was basically increasing the space below the SILDA, the so-called double seat adapter, um, increasing the space in the cone, and last but not least, lowering the apogee to also serve the sub-GTO. Um, with all these measures, uh, we gained additional 500 kilograms of performance. The philosophy for Ariane 6 is a totally different one to Ariane 5. Of course, we build up on our heritage of the Ariane family, but for Ariane 6, we use the modular design from scratch to make it versatile and scalable for all customers and the fast evolving market. Among all the different things we have at stock, I would like to mention Icarus, our innovative carbon Ariane upper stage, fully made um, for performance jumps into orbits which we have not visited yet. For example, the CIS uh, lunar orbit. And these are topics which we have in our pipeline. Uh, thanks to all of our good engineers, our, our excellent teams which make it happen. Thank you to all of them. Well, now, during that film, we uh, picked up the signal. We've uh, heard from the range operations manager there telling us that everything's going normally on board. We will have picked up the signal. From uh, Ascension again. From the tra tracking station in Ascension Island, which is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Da Damien, how does... Well, I was going to ask you, how does uh, Ariane know about where she's going? But we're going to watch a film about the vehicle equipment bay. Embedded software. What is the biggest challenge for developers? What exactly is embedded software? It's the brain of the launcher. It is set for each flight and allows the rocket to navigate independently once the engines have been started. All the phases of the mission are programmed within it. It controls the smooth progress of the flight and is ready for any events that may occur. It reacts accordingly and adjusts the launcher's actions in real time. It is placed in the equipment bay right at the top of the launcher. 
It usually takes between five and 10 years and a team of 100 people to develop it. Just to recap, the embedded software is able to send a 750 ton rocket into space to analyze and respond to all eventualities and all this with complete autonomy. Not bad, is it? But that's not all. Once in space, the launcher and its software are no longer protected by the Earth's magnetic field. Without adequate protection, solar radiation would damage them. So the engineers have designed dedicated electronic circuits to withstand this extremely hostile environment. And that's how you fly a rocket into space, through solar radiation at 8,000 kilometers per hour. Well, when you see such an extraordinary advanced technology, it's no wonder that people from all over the world watch our, our launches. And we've been asking you to write in on social media. Sorry. Everything's going well. To write in and tell us, ask us your questions. And the guys here have uh, done a little triage and uh, picked out a few questions. I'm going to start with you, Damien. A lot of people have asked us about the new rocket which is being built, Ariane 6, and a lot of people are really keen to know, will she be able to carry people? Well, the first step, of course, is reliability, because if you want to carry people, you need a very reliable launcher. And reliability has always been of utmost importance for Ariane family of launchers. It was the case, of course, for Ariane 4. And then in Ariane 5, again, for Ariane 6, reliability will be, of course, a key requirement. And I would like also to recall that for Ariane 5, at the beginning of the project, we have a project named Hermes, for which we were supposed to carry people. And this is why we have a really reliable redundant launchers in terms of reliability. Yeah, and uh, Europe uh, also developed uh, pressurized uh, modules. So I agree with you, Damien, that uh, Europe has everything needed to do that. Uh, the experience, uh, the technology, and as a matter of fact, this uh, market is getting stronger and stronger. I mean, right now, astronauts are uh, going to the International Space Station. Tomorrow they will, be, they will go to the moon uh, very often. And uh, we know that uh, our European astronauts take off from uh, Russian... Uh, launchers, tomorrow maybe, probably, uh, from American launchers, but just imagine what the emotion it would be to see a European astronaut taking off from Cuba. It would be just amazing. It would be fantastic, wouldn't it? It would be really wonderful. Just a quick note to say that we've picked up the signal at the tracking station, the Libreville tracking station, which is on the uh, west coast of Africa. Now, our first passengers to be released are Galaxy 30 and MEV2 for Intelsat. It's a pleasure to be with you today to celebrate the launch of our newest satellite, Galaxy 30. I want to start by thanking two long-standing partners for their ongoing commitment to Intelsat success. Ariana Space with our 60-second launch together today in Northrop Grumman, which has manufactured 11 Intelsat satellites. It's an especially exciting launch day for us at Intelsat because Galaxy 30 shares a ride to space with Northrop Grumman's second mission extension vehicle. Our Intelsat 1002 satellite will be the very first customer of MEV2 services next year. We were proud to partner with Northrop Grumman on their historic MEV geo orbit servicing mission earlier this year and we look forward to pioneering this second mission with them. Thank you to the Intelsat planning, engineering and operations team who have been passionately involved in the Galaxy 30 in MEV2 programs. There's also a deeper purpose and significance to these launches. Every new Intelsat satellite in space means that we're able to connect even more communities businesses, and governments, and in turn, to empower even more people with life-changing connectivity and communication services. Galaxy 30 is Intelsat's first satellite to utilize four frequency bands with C, KA, KU, and L-band services. It will play a key role as part of our C-band cable distribution neighborhood in the United States. It will also serve network, enterprise, and government customers 
with its extensive coverage of North America, including a hosted payload for the Federal Aviation Administration in conjunction with our partner Lidos. Thank you, enjoy today's launch, and go Galaxy 30 and MEV2. Every satellite launch is important for us. Our satellites are our assets in the sky. This particular launch replaces one of our very key video and inputs for our media customers over North America. My name is Pascal Fromont. I'm the director for product management of our media business unit here at Intelsat. Galaxy 30 will be there to enable this richer, higher quality content to reach the viewers and to keep entertainment, news and sports reaching homes at its best quality in a way that is hyper reliable, always on, always on air, ready to be consumed. This launch is not your typical launch. Since the launch of our first satellite back in April 1965, that's 55 years ago, Intelsat has launched 150 satellites. This is the 151st satellite that we launched. But it's actually the very first satellite that has four different frequency bands. It will enable a slew of new applications. It really takes a village to design, build, test, launch, and then operate a communication satellite. It's really amazing how we pull together these different organizations with a common goal. We all really enjoy this kind of work. We get on the console at launch minus 10 hours. And once they ignite those solid rocket motors, it's 100% commitment. So you go through this wave of uh, anticipation, worry, <laughs> calm, and then relief. And then we open the champagne at the end when it's successful here in France Guiana. We're here with a mission. We're here to connect people around the world. It's really a very inspiring business to work in. And Galaxy 30 and MEV2 are the 22nd and 23rd satellites that Ariane Space is orbiting for Intelsat. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, we are getting coming up to the acquisition time for the tracking station in Malindi. So wait, wait, wait. Okay, we have we have that tracking station. So they're now following our launcher. Um, back to our questions from our viewers. Raphael, Lucy is asking, has asked us, is Europe planning any missions to the moon or Mars? Well, I will start with Mars because it's a very uh, good timing to ask these questions because two weeks ago, as you probably know, uh, there is this pers Perseverance spacecraft that took, developed by NASA and uh, took off uh, from the US is going to the to Mars, it's going to the surface, it's gonna grab samples there. And six years after that, in 2026, there is another spacecraft developed by Europe, which will take off, go there, grab the samples in orbit, in the Mars orbit, and bring it back to Earth, and it's going to be in 10 years uh, from now. So this is a good example of uh, uh, long-term um, cooperation uh, with, uh, in space. Huh? Yeah, no, it is. And it's incredibly exciting. Mm. And these are really inspirational and wonderful missions, aren't they? So we have another question, actually, the same one for you, Raphael, because Juanita is quite a related question, has asked us, are you working with other space agencies like NASA, for example? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are working like Europe is working with um, almost all national space agencies in the world. And, well, talking about NASA, just to give you an example, next year, Ariane 5 will launch a very important project. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. A lot of people are waiting for this uh, to be uh, in space. It's going to go at 1.5 million kilometers from here. And it's going to observe the uh, deep space, uh, for example, stars or galaxies that have been formed right after the Big Bang. So it's very uh, major project and there are many, many more uh, projects uh, that are made in cooperation. That's incredible. This is going to be giving us even, even more remarkable uh, information than James Webb. So that's, that's very, very, very exciting. And we have a lot of pressure on our shoulder on this. Uh, the, sorry, I meant even more information yeah. than Hubble, I, I meant course. to say, yes, yeah. of, of course. So uh, we're now, this is this scheduled upper stage cutoff time for our engine of our upper stage. So we are on altitude. 
and uh, at the right speed. And we are now going into the ballistic phase, Damien. Yes, we have a nominal uh, confirmation for the shutdown of the upper stage engine. So that's good to know. Ballistic phase means that we're traveling without propulsion. We're cruising without the engine and we're entering into the next phase now. Just very briefly, uh, let's go back to some of our questions because somebody wanted to ask, uh, Wesley actually has asked, Damien, this is one for you. What advice would you give to young people wanting to get into the space business? Well, first, you don't have to be part of the space business or be or being part of our domains today to join the space community. Because if you are working as a computer scientist, as a manufacturing engineer, electrical engineer, orbital mechanics engineer, structural engineer, whatever, we need all types of engineers and technicians to work. And we have several places where people can join the space community. We have industries like Ariane Group, you have Ariane Space, like a, for a land service provider, and we have also the space agencies, CNES for the French space agency, ESA, and we have also international space agency where we can work if we need. Yeah, and space is not just about engineers. There are lots of jobs in space, there are commercial, um, communication, uh, lawyers, lawyers and etc. But w one thing is certain is that when you join the space sector, you become very quickly part of the family and very quickly passionate about space. And this is, uh, is indeed one big family. We can see here that the Guiana Space Center. Who are we looking at, Damien? Are these the Galaxy 30 teams? Yes, we are looking at the operational team who have worked very hard in the latest days to complete the preparation of their spacecraft. And they are now waiting with eagerness the separation of their spacecraft, which will be like a birth for them because the spacecraft will be ready and will complete its journey on its own. And this is what it looks like up there, that birth that you talked about. This is the scheduled separation for Galaxy 30. Separation Galaxy 30. And we have confirmation there from the range operations manager. Galaxy 30 has now started its new life in space. It's making its way uh, away from the mothership. There you have it, successful uh, separation. Good news for our customers, right? Very good news. A very uh, good um, step uh, for the customers. And the space ballet continues. Of yes, course. this was in, an important milestone, and the maneuvers will go on in order to prepare the separation of the next spacecraft. So our next uh, satellite to be released is MEV2, and it was also supplied by Northrop Grumman for space logistics. Let's find out a little bit more. Hi, I'm Joe Anderson, Senior Director at Northrop Grumman and Vice President of Space Logistics LLC, a Northrop Grumman company. Earlier this year, our first mission extension vehicle, MEV-1, made history when it docked with a satellite running low on fuel, the Intelsat 901. Now IS-901 is back in service thanks to our innovative technology that gives satellites a new lease on life. Our low-risk docking system keeps the customer operational and extends the lives of useful satellites. Once our services are no longer needed by the customer, the MEV is able to undock with the client satellite and continue on to our next customer. Today, we are ready for the launch of our second MEV, which will perform its first docking with another Intelsat satellite, the IS-1002. On behalf of Northrop Grumman and Space Logistics, I want to thank Intelsat and Arians Boss for being trusted partners on this innovative mission. Finally, we have a short animation that shows the MEV-2 mission in more detail. Go Ariane and go MEV-2.
Oh, it's pretty impressive stuff. It really is, isn't it? And the first mission extension vehicle actually docked with, ME, that was MEV-1. Uh, that was launched on board a Proton rocket in October 2019, and it docked with Intelsat 901 in February 2020. So that was this year. And, I mean, it's really exciting, isn't it? Yes, this technology is really amazing. As you have seen in the film, it combines several innovative technology. First, you have to ensure a rendezvous with the customer. To get that, you, you have to get close to the customer, to the spacecraft. You have to check the, its attitude, its angular rate, in order to be sure that you will be in a position to dock to it. And then you have to get very close to it and dock to it. So we have several very critical technologies, the rendezvous one, the docking one, and then it opens also a new business because we, you open a business where you can extend the lifetime of the spacecraft and you even can put it into another orbit. So you can imagine several types of business. And one particularity to be noted for EMEV2, which is the difference with EMEV1, is the fact that it will dock onto its customer uh, satellite directly into the geostationary orbit and not onto the graveyard orbit because MEV-1 was completely successful. So it will gain energy and this is really uh, an important milestone for this new business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really makes sense if uh, the market is still there on Earth to uh, give an extra push for five years and uh, the satellites can uh, deliver uh, services for such uh, five years. So it's very important and in the next uh, in the future, we are hoping to see like even more advanced activities of such MEV satellites, such as satellites refueling, satellites repairing, and even like satellites deorbiting. So the satellite doesn't have to go itself to a graveyard orbit. It can ask for this such a service, and that's a very, very advanced technology. And we can see here the teams at the Guiana Space Center. Who are we looking at here, Damien? Uh, we are looking at the EMEV2 operational teams who are also in charge of the Galaxy 30 in Guyana Space Centers. And they are awaiting for the separation of their uh, spacecraft. Which is coming in in the next few seconds. And there you have it. This is the scheduled moment for the separation of MEV2. Separation MEV2. And we can hear there... The, we've had the confirmation? confirmation. Yes. So that's good news. MEV2 is now on its orbit and uh, separated, uh, pushed away by springs there. And we can see the North Grumman Mission Operations Center there. What are they doing? They're, they're taking control of their satellite, aren't they? Yes. First, they have monitored the status of the spacecraft during all the launch. And now they are taking control over the spacecraft and they will work continuously during the coming days in order to prepare the uh, journey up to the final location for MEV2. So it will include deploying antennas, deploying solar panels, and performing all the required maneuvers in order to get to the required positions and circularizing the orbit. And we still have, uh, of course, BSAT 4B attached. It's hidden at the moment underneath what we call the SILDA. I, I just want to go back to our questions because we've actually had somebody who asked a, 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 just a quick response from you about the SILDA. Um, Tony asked, how can the SILDA be ejected without damaging its satellite? Okay, so to be very short, there are two major points. First, the separation system is made of eight springs. So these springs provide energy to the part of the SILDA which is jettisoned. And when we need it, if the lower spacecraft uh, occupies a very huge volume, we can tune the balance of the SILDA in order to avoid it from tilting during the separation. And the process lasts roughly four seconds. So we've talked a lot, Raphael, a little bit in, uh, previously about how things are changing in space. But, um, you, you know, you, you really do know the satellite markets very well, don't you? How, how have spacecraft been evolving recently? Well, to make it short, basically, we see um, many uh, constellations of satellites in low Earth orbit dedicated to uh, bringing Internet, high-speed Internet. The plan is to connect everyone and everywhere. And even like uh, things like planes and trains and boats, uh, moving things like this. And um, we also see more um, 
constellations dedicated to Earth observation. And these are very important for uh, monitoring the uh, climate change. And um, also, it also serves some new digitalized uh, sectors, uh, such as uh, agriculture, building, um, rescue services, and also very small businesses, such as uh, counting uh, uh, empty spaces in uh, parking lots, for example. Oh, well, that's an interesting one. Very useful. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have a quick look on your app to see if there's an empty space. Yeah. Why um, not? <laughs> but, but we've also seen traditionally that we've been launching a lot of geostationary uh, satellites. Are they changing as well? Yeah, of course. Um, first, we see that um, electric propulsion, instead of chemical propulsion, sometimes um, tend to uh, reduce the size and the mass of the satellites. So this is um, uh, changing. These satellites are also more um, flexible. Uh, it means that they can deliver several services at a time, and that's um, also more uh, powerful uh, for them. This is going to be the case for the satellites that we are launching uh, today, delivering uh, uh, broadcast uh, services with uh, unprecedented uh, definition, uh, so like very powerful uh, satellites. And, uh, and of course, we are hoping to see more uh, MEV uh, missions uh, doing a very, uh, very impressive. For me, this is very futuristic. Uh, this kind of uh, docking to a satellite and uh, uh, and pushing it uh, to the the correct orbit for more years. And of course, you're going to have to. You're you're adapting your launch vehicle to cater for these yeah. different shapes and sizes of satellites. Of course, uh, if the satellites are getting flexible and more diverse, then we need to be flexible as well. As well, so the launcher needs to be able to launch satellites anywhere, uh, in any orbit, uh, any time. And so with Ariane 6 and Vega C, our next generation of uh, launch vehicles, uh, they will be equipped with a reignitable upper stage, allows you to uh, bring any type of satellites uh, anywhere. And for this, we also uh, develop uh, carrying structures, specific carrying structures, in order to offer ride shares, and that's very important for these Very, markets. very important for these markets, and we'll be seeing a lot more of those in the future. Now, I'd like to go over to Japan, if we can, to um, Kiyoshi Takamatsu, who is the head of the Ariane Space Office in Japan. Uh, Kiyoshi, I think it's good morning, isn't it, yes. rather than good evening? What time is it there? Yes, uh, then here it is a good morning in Tokyo. Uh, the Kuru is just on the opposite side of the Earth, so that the time difference is just 12 hours. So it's uh, the same time than 7.44, but it is in the morning, and we are 12, 12 hours ahead, so that uh, we are now on the Sunday, August 16. And where are you exactly, Kiyoshi? Uh, yes, and I am uh, at uh, the, the customer visa and headquarters uh, on the third floor. Um, I'm at an office of the president in Norway. I will try to show him. Hmm. We can see everybody there, Kyoshi. <laughs> Looking good. Lots of yes, waving. Uh, Hi, gang. Can you see that? Uh, Yes, uh, the um, the gentleman uh, the uh, you can see is the president in a way of the Nabisat. So uh, he's not alone. He is with uh, an expert of the Nabisat, and uh, uh, today is and as you know that a very important milestone for the Nabisat, uh, Maxa and the Aryan space. And uh, all of them, uh, the Nabisat is now the congratulation of the, the, the nominal separation of uh, the Intelsat and the GSAT and uh, MEV2. How many satellites has Arian Space actually launched for Japanese operators, Kyoshi? Uh, we uh, have launched uh, the 31 satellite until now, and then soon it will be the 32. Uh, so that uh, this is a good score, we captured uh, about uh, the 75% of the uh, Japanese uh, market. And also that uh, BSAT is a very loyal customer for us. Uh, they have launched uh, all 10 satellites uh, with us, including today's uh, BSAT-4B. 
Well, let's hope, Kyoshi, that in a few minutes' time you will be able to uh, all drink a glass of champagne. It will be an early one, though. Uh, yes, uh, then it will be a little bit early, but uh, then uh, today is on Sunday, so that uh, then after the Ariane complete uh, its mission, we will do our best. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, all of you from the uh, BSAT offices there, and our best wishes to all of you. Thank you. So, um, as we know, Maxar supplied BSAT 4B. They have a very long history um, of expertise of building all kinds of satellites. Uh, we're going to watch a film, and uh, that's going to be followed by an interview which I conducted uh, a few days ago uh, during our previous uh, launch show. So let's find out more now about Maxar. Well, joining me now is Paul Este, who is the Vice President of Customer Relations at Maxar Technologies. Thanks very much indeed for being with us, Paul. Um, just give us a little bit of information about the structure that the satellite is built on. Yes, the BSAT uh, 4B satellite is built on our 1300 structure, which is our heritage uh, structure. We use it for all of our geocommunication satellites for many decades now. Uh, whether the service is direct to home, such as the BSAT satellite, or it's fixed satellite services, or mobile, or including uh, direct audio radio, which we do for Sirius XM. Um, we are also adapted the 1300 structure for a planetary mission. We are uh, sending uh, the structure and the, and the spacecraft out to uh, Psyche, which is an asteroid beyond the orbit of Mars. That'll be launching in a couple of years. And we've also adapted it for a lunar mission uh, for the power propulsion element, which is the first element of the gateway program, which is going to ultimately land uh, the first woman and a man on the moon uh, in 2024. So it's quite an adaptable, uh, flexible and reliable structure. And uh, again, we've been using it for many years. That sounds very exciting. And it sounds like you've got a, a lot going on. You're obviously doing a lot of work on innovation Yes, uh, we are indeed doing a lot on innovation. Um, over the years, we've, we've added, of course, 3D printing, as many people have. We're using uh, innovative techniques in terms of manufacturing satellites, including you know, augmented reality, virtual reality, and, and uh, modern techniques of manufacturing like that. Is this the first time you've worked with Japan? No, actually, we've had Japanese customers for several decades, um, all the way back to Amstar in the mid-'90s. Uh, recently, of course, we've had the BSAT customer. This is the second one we've done for them. We did BSAT 4A, this is 4B, both providing uh, high definition direct to home television for uh, Japan, including several 8K uh, HD TV channels, which are spectacular when you see them. Um, and before this, earlier, about five years ago, we did three satellites for JSAT Sky Perfect. Paul Este, thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, best wishes now as we get close to separation. Thank you very much.
So I was talking to Paul Estee there a few days ago, but it's incredible. They're doing some really exciting stuff, aren't they? I think he has uh, like, uh, summarized uh, pretty well how space is uh, evolving. Like We've heard Moon, asteroids, Mars, 3D printing, uh, additive manufacturing, and we've heard also reconfigurable satellites. And this is also like a game changer for the uh, telecommunication market. Reconfigurable satellites in geostationary uh, orbit is very important because satellites can uh, switch uh, from uh, frequencies. Uh, a single satellite can do this in order to diversify the services. And they can also uh, point at very specific locations on Earth. And here we can see we're getting close now to the moment, the scheduled moment for separation of BSAT 4B. And this is uh, what it looks like. A satellite being... And we have the confirmation there from the range operations manager. So this is, this is excellent news. Congratulations to everybody. Congratulations to everyone at BSAT, uh, to everybody in Japan, and uh, congratulations also to everybody at Intelsat. Good news indeed, Damien. Yes, it is an important milestone to have this confirmation. And uh, best wishes to everybody now as they take charge of their spacecraft because, of course, the teams on the ground will be taking on their roles. Happy faces all around there in the Mission Control Centre, Raphael. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is really what makes this uh, sector very special. Like, when you see these uh, smiles, you see that these people have been working for years on their uh, projects. Uh, an operator of satellites uh, can book its uh, location in space up to seven years in advance before the launch. So the teams between all the partners and the customers are really working hands in hands for several years. But this is why you can see these kind of images. And this is very unique, I think. And it, and it must be a good feeling for them, Damien. Yes, it's really a specific moment for everybody because depending on what you have worked, worked on, even if it's months or years, at the end of this job, you see the result of your job. And when it is a success, it is always a specific feeling. And now I would like also to thank all the teams that were involved in the launch. So the people in Guyana, of course, but also all the team all over Europe on the launcher side and, of course, from our customers. Well, and I'd like to thank everybody as well. We're going to go to a film in a second. But before we do that, I want to thank these gentlemen sitting next to me because it's been wonderful having both of you joining me here in the studio. Thank you very much indeed, Damien Gilles. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed, Raphael Chevrier. Thank you, Katie. Thank it was you. Really good. And I, ho I hope you'll both join us again soon. Um, we're going to go to a film now because we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Ariane launches. Uh, in four decades, they have launched all types of spacecraft into all types of orbit. Let's find out more. Ariane 1, the first launch vehicle designed in Europe, lifted off for the first time in December 1979. It was designed from the outset for geostationary launches. This made it perfect for the growing communications satellite market. Europe quickly capitalized on this opportunity in 1980 by founding Orion Space, the first commercial space transport company. The first member of the Ariane family logged 11 launches between 1979 and 1986 for both government and commercial customers. With this success under its belt, ESA quickly developed Orion 2 and 3. Orion Space would carry out 17 missions with these two launches from 1982 to 1989. Orion 3 added the ability to perform dual launches, sending two satellites at a time towards geostationary orbit, and this technique would quickly become the hallmark of Orion space. At the end of the 1980s came Orion 4, a launcher that used the same basic design as its predecessors, but was even more capable. Because of this rocket's capabilities, Orion space captured fully half of the global market for commercial launches, Orion 4 was retired in 2003, passing the baton to the newest family member, Orion 5. Once again, the idea was to boost its power to handle increasingly hefty telecom satellites, while also maintaining the strategy of dual launches into geostationary orbit. 
At the same time, Orion Space decided to expand its family by offering launches on the storied Soyuz rocket from the Guiano Space Center. This service started in 2011. Then in 2012, Orion Space introduced a new light launch vehicle, Vega. Developed by Avio at the initiative of Italy, Vega clearly showed Europe's expertise in solid propulsion. With this trio of launchers, Orion Space now had a complete family capable of handling all types of missions, whether into low, medium, or geostationary orbit. Orion 5 has now been in operation for 24 years. It has carried out over 100 missions, including some very prestigious ones for the European Space Agency. As it hits 40, Orion Space must now tackle new challenges. Competition has grown fiercer over the last decade. Satellites are changing as well in line with new uses. Spaceborne objects will be increasingly diversified to address a wide range of needs. Not only space probes and telescopes to help us better understand the universe, but also programs designed to make life better on Earth, with space applications that benefit everybody. The Orion space family is evolving to address these changes, thanks to teamwork with our space agency partners. A new version of our light launcher, Vega C, is ready to enter service. Moving to the heavyweights, Orion 6 will soon be in operation. Offered in two basic versions, it will be highly versatile. Orion 6 could also address the small sat market, for example, on missions shared with geostationary satellites. Its new restartable upper stage will make Orion 6 especially effective in the deployment of mega constellations. To ensure its cost competitiveness, Orion Group the industrial prime contractor for Orion has totally revamped its industrial organization and added innovative new processes, such as 3D printing. 40 years on, Orion Space is more than ever a key to European space strategy. We continue to deliver independent access to space for European agencies and governments, while also providing satellite operators from around the world with proven launch service excellence. So there we have it, 40 years of uh, successful launches for the wonderful Ariane rocket. And uh, Stefan Israel is joining me back again here in the studio. Stefan is the CEO of Ariane Space. Just to remind you, the company responsible for launching our, our rockets. Stefan, it's mission accomplished tonight for Ariane Space. Yes, it's mission accomplished. It, be, it has been a perfect launch. And uh, you know that uh, we are very proud and honored to have delivered tonight for Intelsat, for BSAT, for Space Logistics and with our two partners, uh, Maxar and Northrop Grumman, so it's a big success. This is the first time we deliver three satellites to geostationary orbit, so this is a première, as we say in French, and uh, this launcher was the most capable we have ever launched with 10 to uh, tons available for the satellite. So many, many innovations tonight for us. A lot of firsts tonight. And, of course, every space programme involves hundreds, sometimes thousands of people working together, sometimes for many, many years. Who's made tonight's mission possible? Yes, so uh, regarding uh, what uh, the launcher has accomplished, we must thank tonight many partners. We must thank Ariane Group, which is Ariane Space Mother Company, and which is the prime contractor of the launcher, delivering the launcher to Ariane Space at liftoff, what we call H0. We must thank CNES. CNES is a design authority of Ariane 5, and CNES is our daily partner in CNG, and you know that it has been very uh, hard to work in CNG during the COVID conditions, and we must thank our partner in CNES AG for that. We must thank ISA, which is uh, uh, the, the, at the head of the overall uh, program of uh, Ariane in Europe. And so a big thank to ISA. Uh, and for sure, we must thank uh, Ariane Space Team, who have worked as hell to make uh, this success possible tonight. And we had to be a little bit patient, didn't we, for the, la the launch tonight, but we got there in the end. Yes. Thanks, Stefan. So let's see if we can go over to Luce now. Luce Fabriguet in the Mission Control Center at the Guiana Space Center. We're hoping that we can join her because she will be, of course, with her the, the teams there. Luce, what's the atmosphere like? We are... Uh, <laughs> I think you can look on our faces. We are really relieved and uh, very happy and... Uh, 
If I may, uh, Stefan, I would like to, to say a big, big thanks to uh, all the teams. I know that people have been uh, spending uh, weeks and weeks here and uh, working tirelessly to, to achieve this launch. So uh, thanks a lot to, to everybody. And now uh, the journey is, uh, is over for the, for the launcher, but uh, the journey is uh, starting for the satellites and they, they have uh, already acquired the signals, the first signals from the, from the two ones we have uh, separated for Intelsat, uh, Galaxy 30 and uh, MEV2. And uh, maybe they have already, uh, they, they, they are close to, to acquire the signal for, uh, for uh, BSAT 3B for, uh, for Japan. Uh, so everything uh, seems fine. Then, uh, as soon as they have the signal, they will start the operations. First, uh, having the energy, and so for that, uh, deploy the, the the solar panel towards uh, towards the sun. And after that, uh, start the the propulsion sequence. And uh, they all have a chemical propulsion, so it will uh, it will take a short time for all of them to to get to their final um, slot uh, in orbit and. Uh, and uh, we, we wish them uh, all the best uh, for, their, uh, for their lives. Thank you very much indeed, Luce, for taking the time to come and talk to us. And our very best wishes to all the teams now as, as they take on their satellites, as you say. Luce Fabriget, thank you. And good luck for your fine next operations. So, Stefan, today marks the first launch since the resumption of activities at the Guiana Space Centre. What's next? When's the next launch? Yes, so the next launch will be with uh, Ordir Vega. It will be on September the 1st. It's a very important launch because it is what we call the proof of concept of SSMS. We will have 53 satellites on board for 21 different customers. So it will be a very exciting mission and it will be September the 1st. And I really want to thank all our teams in Guyana. Luce uh, has mentioned the fact that the teams have been working for months now. They have uh, arrived in Guyana at the end of May, so we are now mid-August. So you can imagine that with our customers, with our partners, how we have had to work to make this success tonight. So thank you to all of them. And we will be back September the 1st with Vega, and it will be a great event as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Stefan. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here again on the 1st of September for that launch. Uh, until then, I hope you'll join us then. And until then, from Stefan and from me, goodbye. Goodbye.